morning, but also on the other side, some information in the sheet about uh, Stephen Ministry and uh, who they are and what they do. And that's for your edification for you to take a look at. But on the front of the bulletin, there is that picture that also says Stephen Ministry. You may have an idea that we're interested in Stephen Ministry around here. Uh, at least uh, from a standpoint of how a person can be involved to bless the kingdom, how a person can be involved to help us as community and those who are suffering in the community, I want to invite you to seriously consider going to the workshop on March the 7th. It may be four hours out of a Saturday that you think that you may not be able to afford, uh, but I guarantee you that if you have a heart for Christ and if you have um, care for your fellow human beings and you ever thought about how you can be involved in being a blessing to other people who may be suffering, this is a way, trust me, that uh, you will learn more than you, uh, than you need to be involved and you will learn what, uh, what you can actually do and, and you, to tell you the truth, I, I believe, unless I miss my guess, in what I know about Stephen Ministries, that if, if a person does get involved in it, and a year later, if you stay involved in it, you will be saying this one sentence over and over again. I never knew God could use somebody like me to accomplish what he's done this past year. Uh, so let me invite you to consider that. I know certain things are not for everybody, but I... Uh, certainly invites you to at least consider it prayerfully. Pray with me. Father, as we approach your word this morning, we pray that you would open up our minds and our understanding. Thank you, Lord, for the worshipful spirit in this place. Thank you for the willing hearts that open ourselves week by week to your word and what you have to say to us. Consider it carefully and try to put it into practice. Lord, we ask you to do that again in our hearts in our sight, in our hearing, in our experience, Lord, let us see the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up, high and holy, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you uh, recall the story of Alice in Wonderland, you are uh, aware that it's a children's story. But if you recall it in detail, you know that it is not a very pleasant children's story. Uh, I don't know how uh, people could actually read this to their children at bedtime uh, if they want them to go to sleep. And, uh, but that's like a lot of uh, uh, ancient stories. They're, uh, they're not for today's less than uh, steely uh, constitutions. Alice faces some very scary and confusing circumstances when she goes down the rabbit hole. Uh, the, difficulties that Alice faced were fantasy. Most of us will never be confronted with a Cheshire cat or a nasty queen of hearts. Uh, as I think about it, the jury is still out on Tweedledee and Tweedledum, but uh, McConnell and Pelosi make them close, I'm not sure. Cover me, I'm waiting. <laughs> Yes, that was a political statement. And no, it was not a partisan political statement. It's just my estimate of what's going on these days. The crises that trouble your life and my life are as much perplexing, perhaps, as Allison walked through the looking glass. Uh, all through her adventure, she's looking for direction. She's looking for a road to travel. Like Dorothy in the Land of Oz, there's the anticipata anticipation of, of rest and home, if we can just get where we're going. Have you ever felt like that, that something was right around the corner, if you could just get there, if the time was just back, if you just accomplish, you know, fill the blank. You have felt the need for rest. In the 1960s, and I'll own it, that's my generation, the rebellious flower children, uh, the 60s generation was frantically searching for themselves. You've heard that phrase before. I'm looking for myself, looking to find myself. What they found was that they needed something from without to help them understand that which was crying out from within. And 
Paul signed in the Garfield Bill expressed this inner turmoil of that day and Alice and Dorothy as well. Listen to the words of the song Sounds of Silence. All my words come back to me in shades of mediocrity. Like emptiness and harmony, I need someone to comfort me. Homeward bound, I wish I was homeward bound. Home with my music playing. Home where my thoughts escaping. Home where the love lights waiting. Waiting silently for me. I don't think there's a person in this room, or at least a person that's drawn breath on earth, that doesn't want that kind of rest that Simon and Garfunkel wrote about, sang about in their longing for home, or that Alice frantically needed down in the rabbit hole, or that rest that Dorothy could not find in Oz. You remember The Wizard of Oz? Dorothy was far from Kansas, wasn't she? And uh, she knew it. Jesus told his followers how to find that rest. Matthew 11, 28 is our text this morning. Jesus said to his disciples, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I want to say that a few more times, that last phrase, if you will, I will give you rest. I want to say it in a different way each time so that uh, perhaps it will have a meaning for us in terms of the depth of what Jesus said with that simple phrase, I will give you rest. What did he say? He said, I will give you rest. Meaning, I and nobody else like me, because there is nobody else like me. You know what he was saying? I am will give you rest. He also said, I will give you rest. Meaning that it's his choice. He wants to give us rest. And he also said, I will give you rest. Meaning that it's something that is proffered to us. It is something that is laid at our feet if we will really accept it. And he said, I will give you rest. You is an individual word, isn't it? It can be plural, but in this case, it is in the singular. I will give you rest. You come to me, and I will give you rest. See, Jesus comes to us, each of us, in a particular way that we need rest. My wife and I are so different. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> she would know to answer that. Meaning that I am uh, I'm a person who is content to have those in the book. She's a person that is content to do things. And uh, we're so different. And so if she does book barning, as we say, uh, she is just absolutely worn out. Whereas I'm energized. If I do the physical work, you know, poor baby Russell, right? Whereas she, pardon me, <coughs> whereas she is not. She is energized by what she accomplishes and sees the result. I will give you Rest in the way that you need rest. And then he says, I will give you say with me. Rest. I will give you rest. Isn't that a lovely word? Isn't that a word that just absolutely <coughs> sets you on fire? We had a toaster in our house long years, a lot of years ago, when our kids were still young. Uh, that toaster provided entertainment more than toast. It had a frayed wire, and the, the sparks were like the Disney light parade, you know. And it, was, it was kind of entertaining. Electricity knows when you're not its master, and I've learned to respect that fact, that I am not its master. And, but it didn't stop me from trying to fix that toaster. And when I fixed it, it became like other things that didn't get professional care at our house. And uh, my kids called it a dad-fixed thing. Everything that dad fixed would come unglued, come apart, and it was certainly unholy. Well, it's like that with the Christian's walk with the master. Without a good connection, our power leaks out. We become short-circuited. And what happens to anything that's short-circuited? It doesn't work. And so our relationship does not work when we are short-circuited with our connection with Jesus. Jesus' offer is to us to come. 
That's an invitation to come closer to him so that we might be restored to a closer relationship with him. To be restored means to actually go above that which existed before. Too often believers are willing to be in the family of Christ. We're willing to be saved. We're willing to have our sins forgiven and on our way to heaven have our ticket punched, if you will. But to be under the control daily of Jesus, that is a different story. And too many people try to live that way. Beloved, that will wear you out. It's like trying to live in two different worlds at the same time. That old thing about being a Sunday Christian where you come to church and you're all what? Sweetness and light. But Monday through Saturday, children of hell, we act so differently. Well, that's an old characterization. But you know what? I think in some ways there is some of that in each of us. And that's trying to live in two different worlds at the same time. And that wears you out. Because unless you are who you are 100% of the time, you have to invest energy that you don't have in an evil occupation. Jesus offers us rest, the kind of rest that allows us to be 100% who we are all the time, but yet who we are as he's working on us. Now, there's several dynamics that I'd like to explore here this morning about responding to the invitation of Jesus to come to him and to receive that kind of rest. That call is an offer of restoration. Did you hear rest in the word restoration? It is a restoring, a coming back to the condition of rest, a repairing of what we started out to be, but we have messed up. And even more so, Jesus' brand of restoration goes beyond just a new start. It's a start on a higher plane than where we began in the first place. And so, for that restoration touch, for understanding what that really means, we turn in our Bibles this morning to Paul's second letter to Timothy. And actually, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Last week was 2 Timothy 2 and 15, with us trying to seek God's approval by becoming right handlers of the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of truth, it says. But in the very next chapter, in chapter 3 of Timothy's, of Paul's second letter to Timothy, in chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy that to be a right handler of his word, to use the word of God appropriately, and to accept the word of God appropriately, it means listening to what God has to say, not only to us, but about us. Incidentally, when you read the scripture from Genesis all the way to genuine cowhide on the back cover, what you find out is that not only is it a love letter to us, it is all about <coughs> us. Everything that happens in your life, everything that happens in your mind, every word that you speak, every word that you don't speak, everything that you do or don't do, every condition of life that you could ever imagine is contained in this book. How? You should live it. And so, this book is about us, but it is also to us. It's a love letter. And so, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you see it on the screen there. Let's listen to it. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, beloved, Paul did not hiccup. He did not stutter when he stated flatly here that every part of Scripture is God-breathed. What does that mean? Well, we use the word inspired. If you have a King James Version, you read that. All Scripture is inspired by God, right? Um, what does that word mean? It means God breathed. It means God spoke it out of his mouth. God put those words into action. And they are recorded for us. Um, to say that it is God breathed means that there cannot be any error. Years ago, about 40 years ago, actually, there arose in the Southern Baptist Convention a great, great debate about whether the word of God was inspired, whether it was all infallible, whether it's all true, or whether there's certain parts that you could disregard. And that 
contention that at odds with each other because there were people on both sides of that argument in the Southern Baptist Convention that said, uh, some said, it is all inspired. It is all infallible. God can't lie. But there were those who said, well, you've got to consider this and you've got to consider that. And it can't all be little again. And there were back and forth. You know what it caused? It caused a great big split in the Southern Baptist Convention. The group that was kind of wishy-washy about whether the Bible was inspired or not, they became the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, a whole new denomination. The Southern Baptist Convention, which still acts as an independent uh, convention or denomination, not necessarily a denomination, it's not a main line, but it is a convention, a group of like-minded churches that operates under the umbrella of understanding that God directs everything through His Word. Now, that was much more than I planned to say, maybe more than you needed to hear, but for us to have any validity in what we just read about all Scripture being inspired, we have to make a decision about that. We have to make a decision as to whether or not God's Word is useful in every single way, showing us truth exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Incidentally, that's the outline that you have in your hands this morning. So let's dig in. <coughs> Through the Word of God, we have put together and shaped up for the tasks that God has for us, and that brings rest to our souls when we cooperate with that process. So let's take a look at this process. First of all, God word, God's Word shows us truth. It means that it teaches us what's true. The truth that God shows us is how we are in need of being in line with God's pattern as human beings in the way that He created us. You know, there are a lot of different patterns in life, and you can pattern yourself after this hero or that television person or your mama or your grandmother. You can pattern yourself after other people. But God gave us a pattern. Last week in the children's message, I showed them my new electric power saw. I don't know if you saw me hold up that beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, it plugs in. It's electric. You know, you can cut a lot of things, including your fingers off, if you're not careful. And so I, I confessed to the kids that I didn't, you know, I, I didn't really know how to use that saw in all the ways that's intended. But then I pulled out of the bag, I pulled the manual and it said, you know, thanks be to God for that thing because it taught me, right? Well, in just the same way, the Bible, God's Word, is the manual for human beings. And just like my power saw is dangerous, if not understood and operated properly, so the human being must operate within God's will in order for us to, A, get the most out of life that God wants for us, and B, be in cooperation with Him. By the way, the two are interchangeable. Being in cooperation with God in His will is the only way to get the most out of life that God intended for you in the first place. We were created to respond to God's nature, not our own whims and desires. Okay, I talked about the Southern Baptists a few minutes ago. Let me just mention the United Methodist Church. The current tension and the impending split in the United Methodist Church is a textbook illustration of this truth. When humans begin to reject or rebel against God's truth, His pattern for our sexuality, and instead people choose to live in a rebellious perversion rather than as God created us, it should not surprise anyone that the world is going to be flipped upside down in God's judgment. When that happens, God's Word moves from teaching us what is right to exposing what we are doing wrong. And that's the next point that we're looking at this morning. God's Word exposing rebellion, making us realize what's wrong in our lives. The King James Word here is reprove. The Word of God rebukes us by showing us where the error lies. The word rebuke or reprove means to tell a fault. It means to look somebody in the eye and say, what you did is wrong. Sorry I landed with you on that. But that's what God's Word does to us. Points us right between the eyes and said, that is wrong. It happens in a variety of different ways. Uh, but there are only two different responses possible when God speaks that kind of word to us. 
when he tells us that what we're doing is wrong, there are two possibilities. Number one is increased rebellion. Increasing the rebellion. It means you're not going to stop. You're going to stay with what you've been doing. Um, case in point, what's going on in the world today concerning se uh, human sexuality. Uh, if you don't, if, if you're a person who has that traditional view that um, marriage is between a man and a woman for a lifetime, uh, that is the traditional view, that is what the biblical view is. If you are a person of that opinion, well, you are in the minority. We have, we have come back to the catacombs, folks. We're an underground church now. We are against the majority, certainly in America, but even around the world at this point. So, increased rebellion. That's what happens when, uh, when people refuse to receive God's word. The other possibility is when God speaks that word, instead of increased rebellion, there is a cleansing repentance where we say, whoa, you're right. That's not right what I'm doing and I repent of it. I turn from it and I, I'm not going to do that any longer. God, please forgive me. Those are the only two possibilities. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, there's that middle ground, isn't there, where you can sit on the fence? All right, let's take a vote. Is there a middle ground? This means yes, this means no. <laughs> I know, your left is my right, whatever. Okay. We, we, we don't have to take that vote yet. The point that I'm trying to bring out here is simply this. There is no middle ground. There is no not making a decision. When God's word comes right up front to us, there is no denying it. It is God's word. And it either causes us to increase our rebellion by rejecting it or not doing anything about it, or it causes us to be convicted in our hearts and turn to God in repentance for His forgiveness and His cleansing. One of two choices. The exposing of our rebellion is something that God's Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. And this can happen in a lot of different ways and circumstances, but very often God will use a preacher uh, speaking the word of truth in a sermon, perhaps, and the Spirit bringing conviction to the hearer's heart. It does happen that way, but you know, it happens in private ways, too. It happens at times when somebody opens a Bible and suddenly they read something and all they can feel in their heart is that sin that they've been doing. And they realize that God's word is convicting them and they can do nothing, nothing, nothing until they repent of it. Sometimes, when a preacher speaks out and talks about sin, even though he may not be pointing a particular finger at a particular person, it nails a person because the sin is theirs. Maybe it's private, at least to them. And sometimes that leads to the end of the rebellion. But too often it leads to the firing of the preacher because the pride of a backslidden Christian doesn't want to hear all about his own rebellion. <clears throat> my only word at that point is, please don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> God speaks to my heart and I speak what I think he's speaking to my heart. But the process begins here with the God-breathed truth of the word of God which exposes our rebelliousness. But then we move on to point number three is that the word tells us what has to be done to get back on course. God's word corrects rebellion. It corrects us when we're wrong. And correction is something that the doctor does with you every time you go there, hopefully. If you're sick and he gives you medicine, it's to cure you. It's to make you better. It's to correct you, get you back on course. I want you to know that this may be the most difficult part of the whole process of letting God's word rule over your life is making the choice and actually following, following through with correcting your rebellion. It's kind of like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. That young man was a good man. He'd been a good man, a good person all of his life. He'd uh, had a problem, though. He was married to his money. And he wanted to know what further thing he needed to do. And that's the question he asked Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
See, all of his life he'd been a good person. He tried to obey this commandment, that commandment, all the commandments. And he tried to even give to the poor and this and that and the other thing. But he was rich and he was a ruler. And there was that pride. He was in love with his money and his power and his position. And so what did Jesus say when he asked him, when the man asked him that question, what must I do? Jesus said, it's pretty simple, but give up your love of money. And so what did that do? That came right to the heart of that young man's rebellion. Now, he did, unfortunately, the first thing. He increased his rebellion by turning from Jesus and walking away sad that Jesus had thus said, give up your love of money. This was the living word of God correcting the man's rebellion, but the man turned and walked away. Folks, the only thing I have to say about that is, it's tough giving up our favorite sin, isn't it? Isn't it tough? Well, come on, you can admit it. You've got a favorite sin, we all do. Among the sins that every human being sins, we have our favorite. We have that thing that is maybe favorite and most heinous. It is the one we can't conquer. We go back to it. Like scripture says, like a dog returns to its vomit. We return to our favorite sin. But what does the word have for us? What does God's word have for us? What if we hear the truth of God's word? What if we find out that we're off course in rebellion? What if we hear how to change our ways? What if we swallow our pride and we lay it all on the altar asking God's forgiveness? What if? What if we are willing to change our way and surrender our life's pattern for following after Jesus? What happens? I mean, that's where the Word of God teaches us how to stay on course, is if we actually get to that point, we are willing to accept it. We look at what God's Word has said, showing us the truth, and we recognize God is exposing rebellion in us. And then we decide that God's Word, which tells us how to create that, how to correct that rebellion, is absolutely right. And we're ready. We are ready to commit. That's where we move to the last part of this. God's Word training us to live. Training us to be like Jesus. God's Word teaches us to do what's right. And God uses it to prepare us for every good work. Do you realize you can't do anything good for God unless you're cooperating with Him? If you're in rebellion to God, you can't do anything for Jesus. By this point in the process of being restored to peace in our lives, both within our hearts and minds and with other people, we have learned that, first of all, God's Word teaches us truth. God's Word also exposes our rebellion. God's Word shows us how to stop rebelling and start cooperating with God. Now, those are wide pathway principles that cover every area of life. Accepting those principles is a momentary decision. It's kind of like you go to a revival service and the preacher says, everybody's a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Everybody's a sinner. God died for sinners and you need to be saved. And it's by grace that you're saved. Nothing you can do. All you do is present yourself to God. And then he gives a Billy Graham invitation. He says, come, come. Come and confess your sins. Receive the grace of God. He is faithful to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a momentary decision. When you decide that, yes, God's Word is true, God's Word exposes my sin, God's Word teaches me what's necessary to correct it, which is the grace of God, and I am going to act on that. Probably most of you have done that at some point in your life, haven't you? You've come to that momentary decision. Maybe there's somebody here who has it. I invite you to do that because it's all true. But what about that next part of it? That's not a momentary decision. It's a lifetime decision. It's a decision that you make every single day to cooperate with God, to be trained to live. This next final step in the process lasts from the moment you make that decision to accept God 
until that fateful day <coughs> when death closes your eyes. And because you're a Christian, because you believed in Christ, you trusted Him for your salvation, He you saved your soul, and that day you step on heaven's shore. That's when the discipleship process ends, when you step on that shore. I have been following Christ for about 50 years. And I finally realized that it wasn't all about that momentary decision. I mean, that momentary decision to accept Christ is necessary. But when you accept to become a trainee, a disciple, somebody who learns constantly how to deny self, take up the cross, and follow him. I've been doing that for about 50 years. You want to hear my confession this morning? I'm still learning. I'm learning every single day. Remember that old song, He's Still Working On Me? He's Still Working On Me? Not what I used to be, but He's Still Working On Me. Not what I'm going to be, but He's Still Working On Me. Well, it's being conditioned to follow the pattern of right living, the kind of loving and living that only God's Holy Spirit can empower. There's so much more to this last discipleship step than in fitness sermon, a library of sermons. So I just want to tell you a story to close our time together with this. It's the story of one who moved from rebellion to rest. Say rest with me. Rest. Say rebellion. Rebellion. To move from rebellion This one who moved from rebellion to rest was a young boy raised in church. He heard the truth about loving and cooperating with God as his God. And he heard about that at home, heard about it at church. By the time he reached nine years of age, he had begun to, and finally in a momentary decision, accepted that truth and the Savior of that truth and became a Christian. Sound familiar? Many of you have made that decision. But in the two decades that followed, old Mr. Rebellion showed his ugly face and stunted the spiritual growth of this newborn baby in Christ. Did you know that that's possible? You can do what Billy Graham said, come and be saved. But you know what? You can remain a baby in Christ all of your life and never grow beyond, never become a disciple. Never learn to pick up your cross gate and follow him. You can. And that's what this boy did. That ugly face of rebellion stunted this young man. After a couple of decades, he was married and he'd suffered enough through unrest because of his rebellion. He was searching frantically for a way home where the music was playing, where his thoughts were escaping. Or someone was waiting to comfort him. Like Dorothy longing for Kansas. Like Alice wanting desperately to climb out of that rabbit hole. This young man anguished for rest. And finally the word of God came rushing back, making sense, calling him. Calling him to the home not made with hands. And the word who had become flesh and dwelt among us. <coughs> had those hands of flesh outstretched, open wide an invitation to come and learn of the meek and lowly. It was the old, old story that he heard. And it told the young man to take up the yoke again. It was easy, and it was light, and it would lead to rest, the restoration of everything that he really needed in his life. And that young man swallowed his pride and he took that yoke and he felt the outstretched hands come and wipe away the tears from his eyes. And the word of truth then spoke again to the young man's heart. Rest. Enter into my rest, Russell. There's rest for your soul. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. There's rest for your soul. In number 348.
softly and tenderly those hands that remain flesh for the moments. Those hands are called as we stand together and sing.